Welcome back to the RSET training, Mapping Crops and Their Biophysical Characteristics with Polarimetric Synthetic Aperture Radar and Optical Remote Sensing. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Laura Dingle Robertson from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Armando Marino from the University of Stirling. Last week, we learned about SAR polarimetry theory and held the first part of the polarimetry practical, intensity-derived parameters for agriculture monitoring. In the second part of the webinar series, we'll be continuing with the polarimetry practical. Laura Dingle Robertson will show how one can generate pseudo-polarimetric parameters derived from Sentinel-1 data. Following Laura's practical, Armando Marino will provide a practical showing how to analyze a time series of fully polarimetric RCM and SALCOM data to identify crop characteristics with different polarimetric observables. We hope you would join us for all four parts of the webinar series to gain as much value from the training as possible. If you are not able to attend one part, a recording will be made available within 48 hours of the training day on the RSET website. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment for all four parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. Homework will be made available on May 3rd with a due date of May 17th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. By the end of this training, you will be able to explain the theory behind SAR polarimetry, especially as related to crop characteristics, generate a polarimetric parameters using open source imagery and software, and perform a time series analysis of crop growth. Identify how SEN for STAT can support national statistical offices in the uptake of satellite earth observations for agricultural statistics. And, Perform a time series analysis of crop types using Sentinel-2 derived leaf area index. I will now hand it over to Laura Dingle Robertson from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to provide the first practical for today's training. Laura, over to you. Hello, my name is Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson and I work in research and development at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, AAFC, using SAR and optical satellites for mapping and monitoring agriculture in Canada. In this session, I will provide instructions on how to derive pseudopolymetric parameters from Sentinel-1 single look compacts data, which includes, includes the phase information, which is important to generate these type of parameters. There have been many studies that have used Sentinel-1 intensity for all manner of crop classification, modeling, and mapping but there is a treasure trove of unmined information that is available in the L SLC data. Through this practical, you will learn how to derive these parameters from Sentinel-1 data and will be given some idea of what you can use this valuable information for. Polymetry allows for the use of phase and creates richer information than just intensity alone. Sentinel-1 dual-pole VVVH SLC data can be stored in a 2x2 covariance matrix, a C2 matrix, which Sarah has previously described, and uses the full available signal bandwidth and phase, in preserved, and phase is preserved, and each pixel consists of both a real and imaginary component. Using the 2x2 covariance matrix, C2 matrix, we are able to derive scattering parameters that are similar to fully polymetric or compact polymetric parameters. We call these pseudo polymetric parameters as they are not as rich as those that can be derived from the fully polymetric or compact polymetric data. However, this is still a rich body of information that can be gained by, by deriving these parameters from the dual polymetric SLC data. There are many different types of pseudo-polymetric parameters that can be derived, including the following, which we will be looking at in more detail. 
Those include the Stokes parameters, which are a set of values that describe the partial polarization state of the electromagnetic wave, the orientation angle, which is the orientation of the linear polarization with the strongest backscatter, the ellipticity angle, so that's the ellipticity of the scattered wave, the degree of linear polarization, which is the degree of the linear polarization components in the polarized, polarized scattering, the simple linear polarization ratio, which is the ratio of the VH and VV intensities, the span, again, the total intensity of VH plus VV, which is expressed in power, eigenvalues, which are the eigenvalues of the coherency matrix, entropy, which is the degree of randomness of scattering, the alpha, which is the dominant scattering mechanism, which is presented in degrees, and the normalized Shannon entropy, which is the sum of the total backscatter power and the Barakat degree of polarization, which is normalized between zero and one. While many parameters can be derived, you should be sure that it makes sense from a target perspective to use certain parameters in your work. Simply putting everything in a classifier or in a regression model for things like biomass modeling or vegetation modeling or crop classification does not help the understanding of what the parameters are telling you about your target of interest. It is important that you try and understand which parameters can provide the best information about your target. While fully polymetric derived parameters and compact polymetric parameters are something that we have been using in, in our research and studying for years, the polymetric parameters that we are deriving from Sentinel-1 data is new research for us. We continue to try and understand what these parameters mean in relationship to the target. Particularly, we have been looking at the Stokes parameters. The Stokes parameters describe the scattering from a partially polarized electromagnetic or EM field. The Stokes parameters contain all of the polymetric information to describe scattering from a target. There are sp four Stokes parameters that can be defined here where modulus E is the amplitude of the intensity and phi HV is the phase difference between the H and the V. All four Stokes parameters are real numbers. The first Stokes parameter, S0, indicates the total intensity of the radar backscatter, both the polarized and unpolarized portions, which is the sum of the powers of the two orthogonally polarized received waves. Other, the other three parameters, which are S1, S2, and S3, describe the properties of the polarized portion, proportion of the electromagnetic field. Degree of linear polarization is another parameter of interest that we've been looking at that is derived from the Stokes parameters. The way incident upon a target arrives completely polarized. If the target is composed of elements with varying orientations, for example, leaves, stalks, flowers, the waves scattered by these individual elements will vary in both phase and polarization. The degree of linear polarization measures the percentage of the polarized energy, which is linear, linearly polarized. Degree of linear polarization is low where scattering is dominated by circular polarized waves and approaches one where scattered waves are linearly polarized, regardless of the orientation angle. This is based on the Stokes parameters and is measured as described in this equation. You can see here that these contribution parameters are the three parameters of S1, S2, and S3, which describe the properties of the polarized portion of the electromagnetic field. Additionally, we've been looking at entropy alpha. Claude et al. 2012, Claude 2007, developed a dual polarized version of the fully polymetric HA alpha, which is entropy and isotropy alpha decomposition method, which only includes entropy and alpha. First, it extends the idea of alpha as an indicator of the dominant scattering type both the multiple volume scatterer, single bounce or surface scatterer, and double bounce scatterer. So in general, single scatterers will have a lower alpha and alpha will increase as biomass increase. 
which will indicate a change from a dominant surface scattering to multiple or double bounce scattering. You also have to keep in mind that how a wave scatters also depends on the incidence angle. Both alpha and entropy will change with changing incidence angle. Secondly, it extends the idea of entropy from a fully polymetric decomposition as a measure of the complexity or uniformity of a target. On a bare smooth field, the polarization of the scattered wave will be predictable from location, location, location to location in that field. Alpha will indicate a dominance of single bout scattering and entropy will remain low. As vegetation cover increases, the polarization of the scattered wave becomes less predictable from point to point within the field and entropy will increase. What you see in the alpha entropy graph for nearly the bare, for nearly bare sparse field, vegetative fields is that most of the scattering with low entropy, so very predictable scattering, and dominated by a surface or single belt, relatively low alpha. As crops grow, the scattering changes and becomes unpredictable. What is missing from the dual polymetric entropy alpha is the anisotropy, which since this is only dual polymetric data, we can't resolve if there is secondary or tertiary scattering, which anisotropy or A measures, contributing to the total scattering. Sentinel-1 data are available in interferometric wide wave strip map and extra wide swath modes. And all of these data are available in single looks complex data. Sentinel-1 data are available across the world in a temporally and spatially consistent manner, which, which make it very useful for agricultural monitoring. As you may be aware, Sentinel-1B malfunctioned in December 2021 and has not been acquiring imagery since that date. ESA is working diligently to try and fix this issue. Sentinel-1A continues to collect imagery. You can check out the link noted above on the slide and to see where the acquisition plans are to determine the coverage of your area of imagery of interest. Thales Alenia Space is a prime contractor for Sentinel-1C and its twin Sentinel-1D. Airbus Defense in Space is responsible for both radars. The most expected launch date of Sentinel-1C is 2023, as of March 2022. These various acquisition modes come, both, come in both product types of single look complex and ground range detected, and particularly for interferometric, interferometric wide swath mode, SLC, data, the resolution is 2.7 meters to 3.5 meters in the range direction and 22 meters in the azimuth direction with pixel space spacing of 2.3 to 14.1 meters in the range and azimuth respectively. SLC Sentinel-1 data can be accessed on the Copernicus Open Access Hub. You will require a username and password and you can draw a polygon over your area of interest or important area of interest and indicate the specific type of interest that er, imagery that you're interested in and the overall dates of interest. For example, your entire growing season. You can draw that polygon over your area of interest or you can import your area of interest. Once you are satisfied with your search parameters and area of interest, you can search for available SLC data and down those that meet your particular criteria. So for example, I was interested in generating polymetric parameters for an area in Canada to map crops through the growing season. I will look for all available SLC images throughout the entire growing season from May to September. Similarly, you can access Sentinel-1 SLC data on the Alaska Satellite Facility Data Portal. In some scenarios, downloading data are easier at one site over another, depending upon where you are in the world. Additionally, both sites have API functionality and ASF has bulk downloading scripting capabilities. ASF site also has some processing capabilities that relate to INSAR and terrain correction, which are not necessary for this practical but could be of use for other purposes. 
For this practical, I downloaded a July 9, 2020 image that is over an area of interest known as Carmen, Manitoba in Canada. Canola is the top producing crop in Manitoba by area acres seeded. Wheat and soya bean production are the second and third behind canola. This region has a diverse annual cropping mix that includes flaxseed, sunflower, corn, barley, rye, oats, canary seed, potatoes, and field peas. One crop is grown per year and seeding occurs once temperatures allow and soils are dry. Typically, canola is seeded within the first 10 days of May in the SETI area. Harvests, harvest times are more variable due to weather conditions and timing is crop specific. You'll see from this naming convention of the, of the Sentinel-1 image, it fully describes the overall image details. The first three letters describe the mission. So in the case of my downloaded image over Carmen, Manitoba, it was from the Sentinel-1B satellite. The second two limit letters describe the beam mode. In the downloaded image, it is IW or interferometric wide swath. The next three letters are the product type which in our case are SLC, single and complex data. A fourth letter would show up if there was another product type, as this is an indicator of the resolution class. The next letter is the processing level, which in our case is level one processing. The second letter in that group is the product class, for which is for us is SAR standard. And then the final two letters in that group are the polarization, which in our case are DV or dual VVVH. Then the start and date and time of acquisition are listed and the stop date time and acquisition. Finally, we have our absolute orbit number, the mission data take ID and the product unique identifier code. To derive the polymetric parameters from Sentinel-1 SLC data, we have developed a workflow that includes processing that is using ESA's SNAP, Pulsar Pro open source softwares, and a simple Python script. The process is a bit complex, but as, is as follows. In SNAP, we apply an orbit file, and then we complete an S1 top split. We do a radiometric calibration. We do an S1 top burst and an S1 tops merge. We apply our polymetric speckle filter, we apply our terrain correction, and then we export the C2 matrix to Pulsar Pro format and GeoTIFF Big Tip format. We import the C2 matrix that was exported from SNAP into Pulsar Pro. In Prosar Pro, Pulsar Pro, we apply the processes of extracting our parameters, the matrix elements, C11, C22, and span, our Stokes parameters, Stokes components S0, 1, 2, and 3, the orientation and ellipticity angles, the eigenvalues, the degree of linear polarization and the linear polarization ratio, the H alpha decomposition parameters, including alpha entropy, and finally, Shannon entropy. Finally, out of Pulsar Pro, we use our Python script to convert the Pulsar output to GeoTIFF. First, we're generating a C2 matrix with SNAP. You must use single look complex SLC Sentinel-1 data. The first step to create the pseudo polymetric parameters in generating the C2 is generating the C2 two by two covariance matrix using ESA SNAP. Issues with generating S1 polymetric parameters include the processing time and memory requirements. Each interferometric wide swath image consists of three subswaths, IW1, 2, and 3, in the range direction, and each subswath has nine bursts in the, not, in the azimuth direction. Satellite positions are recorded by a Global Navigation Satellite System, GNNS, GNSS. To assure a fast delivery of Sentinel-1 products, orbit information generated by an onboard navigation solution is stored within Sentinel-1 level one products. The orbit positions are later refined by the Copernicus Precise Orbit Determination pod service. Precise orbit files have less than five centimeter accuracy and are delivered within 20 days after data acquisition. The accuracy of the restituted orbit files is less than 10 centimeters, and these files are available three hours after data acquisition. 
To apply an orbit file to a Sentinel-1 SLC image in SNAP, you simply go to the radar image, a radar menu, and select the Apply Orbit File dropdown. The Apply Orbit File window will open, and under the IO Parameters tab, under the source, you must make sure that you're selecting the Sentinel-1 SLC image, and you ensure that you indicate a location for the output target prog product to go to. Under the Processing Parameters tab, you simply want to ensure that under Orbit State Vectors, you are selecting Sentinel-1 Precise, the auto download, and your polynomial degree is 3. You click what, Run and close the window when complete. Sentinel-1 images are very large, and often you do not want to use the entire image, but rather would just use a portion of that that would cover your area of interest. You can, just, you can get just a portion of that area by splitting the image to specific bursts within one of the three subswaths. The top SAR split operator splits each subswath into selected bursts. It limits the amount of data that you will have to process and reduce the processing time and memory requirements. We split the subswaths in staff to speed up the processing and reduce the amount of data we are trying to process. To split the subswaths in SNAP, we again go to our radar menu and select Sentinel-1 tops. And we will go to the dropdown of Sentinel-1 top split. Once again, the Sentinel-1 top split window will open. Under the IO parameters tab, you want to make sure that you select the orbit corrected S Sentinel-1 SLC image and make sure that you indicate where you want your target out image to be outputted to. Under the Processing Parameters tab, you want to select the subswath. It will be either S1, uh, IW1, IW2, or IW3. Under Polarizations, you would like to highlight that make sure that both the VV and VH polarizations are selected. And under Burst, you can reduce the bursts to those that fall over your area interest by choosing the arrows on either side and dragging them to reduce the number of bursts altogether. Once you have the number of bursts that you are interested in that fall over your area of interest, you click Run and close the window to be complete. SAR SLC products are complex and must be converted to real and intensity and imaginary phase channels. The conversion is mission specific, and for polymetric processing, the data must be complex. SNAP will automatically determine what kind of input product you have and what conversion needs to be applied based on the product's metadata. To apply the radiometric conversion to your split Sentinel-1 interferometric wide image, you would need to go again to the radar menu and select radiometric and the Calibrate dropdown. The calibration window will open, and you will ensure that under the IO Parameters tab, you're making sure your source is the S1 top split and orbit corrected image, and that your target product is set to be output to the appropriate folder. You select Save as a complex output, and choose Run and close the window when complete. The images for all selected bursts from the previous uh, uh, results in the selected subswaths can be resampled to a common pixel spacing grid in the range and azimuth while preserving the phase information and all bursts are merged. To deburst your split image, you need to once again go to the radar menu, go to the Sentinel-1 tops menu, and select S1 tops deburst. Under the IO parameters tab, once the S1 tops deburst window opens, you make sure you select source image is the orbit top split and calibrated Sentinel-1 SLC image, and that you have indicated where you want your target output, target output product to be put. Under the Processing Parameters tab, you simply select both, both images, the VH and VV, 
and you select Run and close the window when complete. This merges your now calibrated orbit corrected bursts back into one image. If you've processed multiple subswaths, so one, two, or three of them, you would then use the S1 tops merge to merge the debursted images you have just corrected into one main product using the S1 tops merge operator. If this will merge the subswaths back to the main product. To do this, you're once again using the radar menu and the tops drop downs, but this time selecting tops merge. Once again, make sure that the IO parameters source image is the orbit, top split, calibrated, and tops debursted Sentinel 1 SLC image and that you've indicated where you want your target product to go. Under the processing parameters window, you will simply select the two polarizations of VVVH and click run and close the window. In our scenario, we only selected bursts from one subswath, so we do not need to do this particular step. For polymetric parameters, the filter chosen must ensure that there is a preservation of the phase and polymetric information while suppressing the noise. You cannot apply a simple speckle filter on if you're trying to maintain the phase in a polymetric image. There are four polymetric speckle filters that are available in SNAP. Again, the choice of the filter type and size should be related to your area of interest and what the final data will be used for. The output of the polymetric speckle filter is the finalized C2 matrix values. To apply this polymetric speckle filter, you go to the radar menu, choose the polymetric dropdown, and the polymetric speckle filter. Under the IO tabs parameters tab, you want to make sure your source image is the orbit, applied orbit, top split, calibrated, and tops deburst and merged if you were using more one subswath, Sentinel-1 SLC image, and indicate where you want your final uh, polymetrically speckled filtered image to go to. Under the processing parameters tab, you will choose the type of speckle filter you want to use, and then of course your filter size. In this scenario, we are using a boxcar filter and a seven by seven window size. Click run on the window and close the window when you're completed. So the C2 matrix is now generated, but before we transfer this to Pulsar Pro, we would like to terrain correct this. So terrain correction with the use of a digital elevation model can corrects the topographical distortions like foreshortening, layover, and shadowing, as we've mentioned in the previous training. The range Doppler approach, once again, is one way to perform geometric correction. The method needs information about the topography, which is provided by the digital elevation model, as well as orbit satellite information to correct the topographic distortions and derive a precise geolocation for each pixel of the image. To do the geometric terrain correction, you go to the radar menu and the geometric dropdown, selecting terrain correction and the range Doppler terrain correction. Ensuring under the IO parameters tab that your source is the C2 matrix products, Seeing now, you have the bands of C11, C12 real, C12 imaginary, and C22. And you will also want to ensure that the options chosen for these digital elevation model and map projection are available related to your area of interest. For the image over Carmen Manitoba, we use the SRTM one second HGT auto download DEM and the map projection is UTM zone 14. These parameters though should relate to your area of interest. When you're complete, you select run and close once the processing is done. We now need to export the C2 matrix from SNAP so it can be used in Pulsar Pro. 
Parts of ProFarmit has all bands in, of data in .bin and .hdr header pairs. It also has a .config text, a config.txt file, and a metadata.xml file that are all completed under the output folder. Plus, we will also need to export a version of the terrain connected image to be used as a master TIFF during the Python scripted generation of the terrain corrected TIFFs from the Pulsar Pro output. To export files in both the Pulsar Pro and the GeoTIFF Big TIFF formats, you simply select the File Export drop, the File menu and the Export drop down, SAR formats for the Pulsar Pro format, and the GeoTIFF Big TIFF for the GeoTIFF Big TIFF format. We would now use ESA's Pulsar Pro version 6.0.3 to generate the polymetric, pseudo polymetric Sentinel 1 parameters. So, Pulsar Pro is a very long term research software that was developed for fully polymetric data analysis. It is completely free and open for download from the associated link. This is a very powerful tool for polymetric analysis but it is a little tricky to install. So you can follow along with the readme files that are provided at the download to install the various associated programs and the generalized main program Pulsar Pro. And you can look on the ESA site for details on how to fully install the Pulsar Pro software. The first step, once the Pulsar Pro software has been installed, is to calculate SAR polymetric parameters using Pulsar Pro. So you will want to import your data. First step would be to create a C2 folder and copy all the Pulsar Pro files that you had exported to SNAP to this folder. The C2 folder name will actually enable Pulsar Pro to recognize the data set as a C2 matrix. You also must modify the config.txt file that was generated when SNAP converted the files to Pulsar Pro format. In the config.txt file, you want to change the polar type from dual to PP2. This term allows Pulsar Pro to identify that this data is represented as a two by two matrix. You will now set an environment in Pulsar Pro. You will start your Pulsar Pro edition on your desktop. Click on the Pulsar Pro biomass on the initial toolbar, then select the enter on the pop-up. The main Pulsar Pro toolbar will open. Set your environment by choosing environment single data set and go to the folder, the directory that is holding your C2 folder. Once you've pointed to that directory and it's recognized the C2 folder, you will collect save and exit. Now you'll generate the C2 matrix elements. In the main Pulsar Pro menu bar, you will select the process tab and drop down of matrix elements. The data processing covariance elements C2 window will pop up. In this pop up, you will select C11 modulus, C22 modulus, and the span linear options. You will run these and these selected parameters will be generated and stored in your C2 folder. Modulus is a linear representation of the considered C2 element amplitude and of course span is the quantity giving the total intensity received and in terms of our scattering matrix it's the total power equal to the sum of all the matrix elements. You will next do your Stokes parameter generation. Under process again, you will select polymetric functionalities slash one and under the next dropdown, 
select Stokes parameters. Under the Stokes parameters pop-up, there are many parameters to choose from depending upon your application of interest. We are, as we mentioned, we are newly interested in looking at these pseudopolymetric parameters. So we have just begun to start to understand what all of these different parameters mean in relationship to the target on the ground. In our scenario, we select the Stokes components, which in this case are called G0, G1, G2, G3, but are the S0, S1, S2, and S3. The orientation and ellipticity angle, the eigenvalues, the degree of linear polarization, and the li linear polarization ratio. You select those parameters of interest, and then you set your window size, x by x, of the sliding window that's used to compute the local estimate of the average matrix. The selected parameters, once you've selected that, you click Run, and the selected parameters will be generated and again stored in your C2 folder. We will next generate the entropy alpha decomposition parameters. Once again, you select Process, but you select the H. A, which represents anisotropy and alpha decomposition, and then the dropdown of the decomposition parameters. Once the data processing HA alpha decomposition window opens, you simply select alpha and entropy and the and an entropy parameters that we are interested in generating. Again, you will set your window size in our scenario five by five, and the selected parameters, click run, and the selected parameters will be generated and stored in the C2 folder. So all of your parameters have now been generated and are stored in your C2 folder. At this point, you wanna associate back the geometric information that was encoded on these parameters, and we use this provided script convert underscore pulsar pro underscore output underscore to tiff dot pi to convert those pulsar pro outputs to appropriate tiff that can be used in other software for other purposes. The Python requirement for this script is Python 3.6 or greater and you must ensure that you have GDAL installed. The files required are the Pulsar Pro output C2 folder, the master TIFF, the GeoTIFF big TIFF that you generated from the step of exporting to the terrain corrected file to GeoTIFF big TIFF from the final step step, and that contains all the georeferencing information. And finally, the list underscore parms dot text file, which contains a list of the parameters in the C2 folder that you want to convert to TIFF. So the parameters to change are all located at the very bottom of the provided script. This includes your in path, which is where is your location of your C2 folder, your out path, where do you want your georeferenced parameters to end up, and your list underscore parms dot text should be located here. And then finally, your master file. And this is the file, the geotiff slash big tiff that you generated in your last tip step out of SNAP and is the location of your master file for georeferencing. So here's some examples of the outputs. So the first Stokes per vector parameter, SO, is an indication of the total intensity of the radar backscatter, both the polarized and unpolarized information. And this is the sum of the powers of the two orthogonally polarized received waves. The other three parameters, S1, S2, and S3, describe the properties of the polarized portion of the electromagnetic field. The figure on the right is an RGB component of the SO, S1, and S2 parameter. And the figure on the left is our associated annual crop inventory for 2020 over the 
carbon Manitoba area. This is a thematic map of crop classes that AAFC produces on an annual basis. So you can see here, there are varying crop types and variations in the fields of the snow parameters on the right image. These do correspond to the varying crop types that are found on the left images. Once again, we've circled an examples of the pivot irrigated fields on potatoes, which show up as circular and bright yellow on the right figure and correspond to the thematic map as the pink cir colored circles. So recent works we've done using Stoke factors derived from compact telemetry data have shown that ellipticity and orientation characteristics of the polarized scattered waves vary among crop types and change as crop stru structure changes and phenology progresses. And we are able to use Stokes parameters across seasons to help with crop classifications. Here are some examples of the degree of linear polarization images. So high values of degree of linear polarization represent that the waves are being scattered in a linearly polarized manner, whereas low degree of linear polarization represent that the waves are circularly, circularly or elliptically polarized. Again, we have the figure on the right is the degree, the degree of linear polarization image that was generated with bluish areas representing low degree of polarization values and red and orange areas representing higher degree of linear polarization values. We see low DOLP for July 9th are related to canola fields, which we can see on our annual crop inventory thematic map, and higher degree of linear polarization relating to soybeans. We've seen in previous research that as crops develop more structure and biomass in their canopies, more of the scattering is returned with less linear polarization. Canola in July is generally in a later flowering stage, which, is a more, which has a more complex canopy structure. Soybeans in early July are typically at an early flowering stage on a BBCH scale of about 60, with less, less than 10 to 30% of flowers opened. The canola canopy is structurally more complex at this stage, and thusly more of the scattering will typically be circular or elliptical, and will result in a typically lower degree of linear polarization. You can relate the high and low values of DOLP, not only to crops, but actually to specific stages of crop growth and biomass and leaf area index. These types of images can be added to classifiers as additional information regarding crops, or it can be used in regression modeling or other crop phenology modeling. In this example, we show the generated alpha figure on the right and the generated entropy figure on the left. In gradients from blue representing low values and red representing higher values we can see there are more areas of higher entropy and alpha that can relate to where there is multiple scattering as expected in areas where there are growing crop fields. Similarly, we have areas with lower alpha, blue areas, and higher entropy, red areas, that are indicative of more surface scattering. What we have found in the past is that at the range of incidence angles at which this Sentinel-1 image was acquired, when wheat has lower biomass, we expect entropy at around a 0.63 values and higher biomass wheat to be at approximately 0.7 values. For canola, lower biomass has higher entropy values at about 0.88 with high biomass canola having lower entropy values of 0.78. As I've mentioned, in any case, there are many, many types of things you can use these parameters for, such as modeling biomass and LAI, feeding these models uh, into models for crop phenology, feeding these images into classifiers for crop classification, extracting values and assessing them in relation to other existing earth observation indices and models. The sky is the limit. The big benefit is that there is a seven-year record of 701 SLC data with consistent coverage around the world. 
there is a lot of information from these SLC images that can now be mined to help with the crop monitoring, modeling, and mapping in a temporally and spatially consistent manner. Welcome everybody. I'm Armando Marino, and I'm really uh, honored to, today to be here presenting this part two of this training on SAR polarimetry with the uh, RadarSat Constellation mission and SAOCOM, Im SAOCOM imagery for agriculture. Uh, before we start, just a few uh, words about myself. Who am I? Uh, so I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Stirling in Scotland. Um, uh, my teaching is about Earth observation and uh, SAR in particular, and my research is mostly about polarimetric SAR and use of uh, polarimetric SAR. So, back to um, this practical. Um, the, the plan is that by the end of this practical, uh, you will learn how to uh, run Python code for processing Pulsar data. You will learn how to open a binary file in Python, how to visualize images, how to perform filtering, how to manipulate the elements of the covariance or coherency matrix, how to derive the elements of cloak Cotier decomposition, and how to produce a time series of polarimetric observables. Looks like a lot of stuff, isn't it? But follow me during this next hour and you will see we, uh, we will get to the bottom of this. So today we will be using Python, and I don't think I have to introduce Python to you. I think everybody knows what it is. It's a programming language, and um, you can install it. Oh, my suggestion is that you install it using the Anaconda installer. Uh, in between the material that you will get from this uh, course, uh, you also have some explanation on how to do that. Using Anaconda is possibly the easiest way. The only thing you need to be careful that you install a 3. Point something, 3.9 maybe, version. So don't go for the 2.7 version of Python because it will not work. So go for the um, 3.9. Uh, once you have installed, you will uh, see that you will get a, an icon here for accessing your Jupyter notebook which is what we will be using today. We will talk more about this. So Jupyter Notebooks open a website, and, uh, web browser, sorry, and uh, we will see this more uh, later. Uh, but also there is another editor offered, offered by the package of Anaconda, which is called Spider. So now Spider is possibly what I would suggest you to use if you want to make this a bit more automatic, in a processing stack, it's a bit more automatic, like you can have a scheduler calling your function, this kind of things. It's easier to do in Spider, so that's why I mention it, but uh, for educational purposes, Jupyter is much easier to, to use for learning, so that's why I'm using Jupyter Notebooks. Now, the possibly the one of the core of these things, the data that will be used, the, the highlights of this practical, the data that we'll be using. We have two fantastic data sets, and we are really uh, grateful to the uh, space agencies that allow us to use them. The first one is a rather sad constellation mission. We have five images acquired in uh, near the town of Carman in uh, 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 Manitoba, uh, Canada. Um, I will tell you more about these images later on, just, just a, a, a quick look of how, how they look like. And uh, uh, so this, this was, uh, these are rather sad two images, so, uh, which is an official mark of Canada Space Agency. While the second data set we use is a SAOCOM data set from uh, CONAI, which is the Argentine Space Agency. And this is L-band, while well, rather sad constellation mission is C-band, so different frequency, which is very interesting to investigate. And the uh, location is also different. This one is in Argentina, near the city of Cordoba. But again, we will, you will hear more about these things later on when we start to working with these data sets. So at this point, I, we are ready to start with the actual practical. So the first thing you have to do is to get to your Jupyter notebook. So you go to your uh, the icon of the Jupyter Notebook, wherever that is, and you'll see uh, this will open in a web browser. <clears throat> so 
Here we are. Um, you see, the screen uh, is a list of folders and files you have inside. And you may want to create a new uh, folder here uh, by new, and then you go to folder. I already have one called RSET. I put my files there. Then you want to upload here the files that you will get from the um, from this training course. So you you get them from the the website of the training course, and then you can copy them inside your folder for the Jupyter Notebook. Now, you see there are different full, uh, files here, dif uh, different scripts. Uh, the one I want to start with today is this one, one acquisition, rather than constellation mission. You'll see there is one with and without the word solution in them. Um, my suggestion is that you try the one without solution first, and then you go looking at the solution later. So that's the one that I will start first. Also start with this one acquisition. Don't start with the time series. The time series script is much more complex. You don't want to start with that. Uh, this one is more approachable. You start using it, you learn how to do it, and then you move to the uh, time series. So click on it and you start seeing the scripts here. <clears throat> now you see there are different sections of this script. Each one of these sections is called a cell. The one with the blue uh, banner on the side are markdown. And they are text. They're not really uh, things for the machine. So the, the Python doesn't do anything with it. It just displays for us. Uh, if you go inside, you also see there is a um, like latex type code where you can write down things. And they look very nicely uh, with a very nice layout. So in this data set here, we'll be using <coughs> rather sat uh, constellation mission. We start with that, then we move to the SAOCOM data. Uh, what I did here is to pre-process this data using SNAP. So I did several operations, including calibration, subset, create the coherency matrix, then a multi-look to one, so that the pixel is more squared. Then I did the co-registration in a stack which we'll be using later when you use the um, time series. And this is important. You have to co-register the images, the images, otherwise they will not overlap. And then I did a geocoding at the end. Um, so to run a cell, you can go with a shift enter or control enter as well, or you can click the button here, run. You see the markdown don't do anything at all because this is not code for the machine. But here we start dealing with actual code. And you see there is this weird coloring because uh, Jupyter is helping us understanding the different parts inside the, uh, the script. So uh, when you have an hash to start a line, this means it's a comment. Comment means instruction for humans, not for uh, machines. The machine, Python, doesn't do anything with that. It's just text for you to, to read and to know what is going on. And it's always good to annotate your script properly so that you know what is going on in different parts of the scripts. So the first cell here is loading, is importing libraries. We import NumPy, matplotlib, pyplot, import scipy, math. You can see all what they do later, but are things that we use. Libraries are collection of functions that we will be using when we run our code, when we have to do operations. Um, uh, there is also one library here that I've commented out. This is called Spectral. Uh, this is very useful for reading headers of images, <clears throat> as you will see later. The thing is that this library you have to install yourself. It doesn't come with an account installer. And sometimes installing libraries is complicated. There is some instruction of how to do it. I wrote this uh, inside this uh, Word document that I put there. But if you don't succeed to install it, then leave this two line, this line here uncommented, without comment. If you manage to install it, very good. You can uncomment it and go with it using the library if you manage to, manage to install it. But if you don't, it's OK. Don't worry. Just uh, leave it out. 
uh, to uncomment something you go control backslash at least in uh, with windows so there are other libraries also you can add here but you, i leave this to you and also i will tell you more later about this so let's run this uh, uh, this cell and uh, we run okay then this part of the scripts we accumulate all our functions the, the function we define a function is a very useful thing when you program because you can in a single line of code you can encapsulate a lot of lines of code so it, it makes things very easy also if you put these things inside a library and i will tell you more later about this um, uh, you can have this repository with all your function and when you make a change in a function inside the library all the other scripts that call that library will be updated because they will look at the new library at the new function so it's very cool very useful you should do it um, so here what we do again uh, we want to no again what we do here we want to open uh, an image with an mv format now snap saves images in an mv format and uh, i have some image here so to see how they look like they come with a header the header is basically a text file and there's a lot of cool information about the image for instance how big it is or what is the um, the type the data type <clears throat> now uh, if you manage to install uh, um, spectral then you can uncomment this line and the library spectral they call it here envy uh, will go inside the header and read this information for you but if you don't manage to install spectral then i hard coded this information inside the script so that you can still run the code uh, but you need to go there personally manually read this number and put them inside the code um, and you will see this later when we call the function so try to install otherwise you just need to do manually uh, so what does this function do is to open an image which is in a certain uh, with a certain name a certain path with a certain file name and then reshape it in a, in a, um, a fashion that you can see as an image this is another uh, bit of a quirky thing <clears throat> um the these images or windows that i'm using use the fortran format for um, representing images where you have the, uh, the first uh, um, uh, coordinates is vertical and second is horizontal um, if your operative system or the way you store the images use the the, the c uh, convention which opposite first coordinate is horizontal second is vertical then you need to use this other line of code <clears throat> but anyway you will see when you start running these things if you do wrong selection of parameters the image just, just won't display you will see clearly that there is something wrong and then you need to change the parameter okay so this one uh, uh, select the path where the images are where the images are stored so for me the path is called this way and <clears throat> for you will be obviously differently it will be a different path also i like always to create a folder where you can dump things that you save so you produce so it is not in the same file the same folder creating confusion you have a different folder for your output so this has to be modified it won't uh, the code won't run if you keep it as it is because this is good for me but not for you um this is the part that i was telling you before the hard coded bit in case you cannot install uh, spectral so what i did here is to look for the number of column and row inside the header for the um, rcm images and also the data type i know that the, the number four represented there correspond to float four and i know that my machine is using a uh, um, those images are big endian so this is this symbol here um if you have to code this you need to have a look at the table so to convert the env format into a um, this kind of python format and also if you have troubles uh, just ask uh, we are here to help 
Um, so um, by keeping the hard coded things, I can run the code without the uh, function spectral. But if you install spectral, that's it. You, you have done it. It's, it's, it's easier that way. Now, let's start the most more interesting things. So preparation is finished. We are ready to start loading these images that we previously saved with Snap. As I said, what I do in SNAP as a preprocessing, I created a, a covariance matrix that I geocoded. So the data are now in a covariance matrix format. If you look here, there is the T11, T12 imaginary, T12 real, T13 imaginary, T13 real, T2, T3, and um, um, T3. So, all the elements of the covariance matrix. Now, how many independent parameters do you expect to have there? So we have three diagonal elements, which are our intensities. In this case, are the intensities for the, the Pauli component, the components, because I use a Pauli basis for representing them. So we have these three intensity on the diagonal. And off, off diagonal, we have the cross correlations between the components of the Pauli basis. <clears throat> cross correlations are complex numbers. So for each cross correlation, we have two numbers. You remember when uh, the, uh, the theory about complex numbers that you saw in the previous um, presentations. So uh, you have three real and three complex in totally makes for nine values so you actually have nine images that you need to um, to work with uh, but at the end is six after you put them together you will see you end up with six elements but two three of, the, of which are complex so we can go now to this part here when we read these images and i think you will see something weird going on here. This word quids coming up. So the word quids is obviously not a machine uh, instruction. It's my quirk way to tell you that you can add something here. So this is your exercise. You can add something here to fill up the code. So um, uh, my suggestion is that uh, you try to do this exercise by completing the script, adding stuff when you see the word quids. And this can be a simple word, a simple word, this can be a line of code or can be few lines of code. But when you see the word quids, it means that it's you, you have to go there and try to complete the code. If you try to run this, you will see it will crash. It will give you an error. And the error says name quids is not defined. I'm not surprised. I just made it up. I just put this word there. <laughs> so um, the, the way you have to do it basically is to try to complete it. And you see, for this example here, it's not that complicated. You you just have to say that the file name here is t22 instead of t11, and then these things stay the same. See, so you can just copy and paste really this bit here. But I'm not going to complete all the quizzes with you at this point, because otherwise we need two, three hours for doing that. It takes too long. So for the sake of brevity, uh, I leave this to you. And my suggestion is that you try to do, unless you're looking at this live, if you're looking at the recording, so later on, or you got these things before the, the live session, my suggestion is that you try this exercise on your own. When you get to a quiz word, you try to write it something there. You pause my video, you try to write something there on your script. If it doesn't work, you unpause my video and you see the solution that I'm showing you now. So that you try this yourself first. Trying it yourself, of course, is very good because you, you, you start understanding what is going on. You just run it. You don't learn how to run it, but you learn how to write it. You learn how to do it yourself. So that's why my suggestion is to try to do yourself. But now, for sake of brevity, let's just move on to the solution script. So we go back to the uh, main screen of Jupyter, 
And this one you see is green, it means that it's active, it's still working. What you want to do is to close it, you shut down, and then you open the one with the solutions. We can scroll down to the point we arrived before, and we can run all the cells that we have run before. So you could run all above, and it just runs everything is above that. Then <clears throat> here, what we do is use the, the function we define open MV image uh, to open the different images. Different images have different names. So you need to make sure that the name you're putting here is one that you have inside this folder here. This is actually for SAUCOM, so <laughs> you won't find that date inside here. But you have to make sure that the, 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 the image actually exists inside your folder. Then the input parameters is this one, and the things running it allow it gives you the, the different images. So you get the T11, T22, T33, which are the three element intensities of the components of the um, Pauli vector. And then you get the off-diagonal elements with T11 and so on. You see your T11 being a um, cross-correlation is a complex number containing a real and an imaginary part. And this is because you know complex numbers are composed by real and imaginary parts because they, they have to represent waves and so waves have amplitude and phase, you need two numbers, you cannot do it with one. Um, so you have to read them separately, but then you have to put them together in a single complex image. And you can do it by just summing the two using the, uh, the uh, imaginary unit here, which in Python is written 1j. Uh, so that tells that these things is the imaginary part. Um, so uh, once you have created this complex image, it's a good practice to remove the um, just the real and imaginary part separate. Why you want to remove them from your uh, from your memory? Because they occupy memory, they make your processing slower, and they may also uh, crash your system if there is too much stuff inside the memory. So keeping your memory as empty as possible is always good practice. So you don't need them anymore, we delete them with this function del. And then here we repeat the same for the one, three element and for the two, three element. So running this one and it goes smooth. Why do we need this ij element here for creating the complex number? Well, you have learned that the complex number is composed by real and imaginary, and the ij is the way that you represent the, uh, the imaginary part you put in front of the imaginary part. But if this is not very clear, you can go back to the, um, to the theoretical part of this course where, where these things was explained. So we can keep on uh, processing, and then we get to uh, this bit here. Now, what we want to do here is to visualize uh, an image to see what is going on. If what we get is actually an image or whatever is inside those data. Um, in polarimetry, in, um, in SAR polarimetry, it's very handy to use RGB images for that. Um, so I think you're all familiar with what is a, a, a composite image, an RGB, a full color image. But what you do here is you, to assign different color to different images and then plot them all together so that you can see the different composition of colors inside the, um, what you're observing. So once you want to do this, when you want to do this in Python, uh, the first thing is to create a, a container for these images. And you do this here by this I RGB. So this is a container with three dimensions, and the first two dimensions represent the size of the image. So three, because you have three um, RGB, three images you, you can represent. But how do we select the different color for, for the representation? Uh, once you, you, when you are using a Pauli basis, which is what we are doing here, is saying convention uh, that you select the colors in this way here. 
For the red color, which is the first channel of this container, you choose the T22, which is the intensity of HH minus PV. This represents horizontal dihedral, also people refer to them as double bounces sometimes. And so that was one we choose to go in red. Then as a green color, which is the second channel here, one, uh, you generally, you normally select T33, which is twice the HV channel, or HP plus VH divided by two. <coughs> And uh, um, this, well, why we do that? Because they, uh, this type of target represents 45 degrees oriented dihedrals. So we take a dihedral and you orient 45 degrees, which is a bit weird, but they do happen in nature. But also because these things are not very common, these, these oriented dihedrals, you don't see them everywhere. Um, uh, what it also represents a lot is the uh, random volume scattering. Random volume goes everywhere over the polarization channels. And since the T33 contains not much of the rest, you see a lot of volume there. So people refer to it also as volume, although theoretically it's this 45 degrees oriented dihedrals. As a, a third channel, so the blue one, we select T11, which is the intensity of HH plus VV. This represents surfaces, trihedrals, or more generally, odd bounces. So why we choose the blue for this? Because they, uh, the C, which is the surface, appears blue, which is very nice. And uh, so if you look at scenes, you will see a forest appears as greenish, and water appears as bluish. It looks good. <clears throat> so that's why we normally uh, select these colors. Now, uh, once you, when you do these things, you have to pay attention that uh, Python does not like uh, images or the function that we use image show doesn't does not like images to be bigger the values of the pixel to be bigger than one. So you have to normalize in a certain way. The way that I do is by using the mean and the factor, and then uh, to clip into one everything is above one. My suggestion is that you play with this factor to see what happens. So try values like 0 0.5 or values like say 10 and see how your image change. So you get darker or brighter uh, based on how you play with this uh, value here, with this factor. So uh, once you have done that, then we open an uh, object called fig figure, then we put a title there, and in show our image inside. And we also we save the uh, image inside this path save that we defined before. You may decide to don't save your images, but it's a good practice to do that. Uh, also, of course, you have to use a better convention for name than just test. <laughs> this is just a test test these days, but you, you, you should use a better naming of the, <laughs> the image. So we run this. And our image comes here. You can see the number of pixels here on the side. <clears throat> okay, I think we talked about this, the physical interpretation of the Pauli RGB, and why we choose those colors. Uh, what, I, uh, what we do here is to reduce the size of the part of the image we are working with. Now, images, our images are very big. And if you start working with these huge images, it is very likely that your RAM gets full and then the process gets very slow or, crash, or crashes. The data that I'm providing to you in the stack are already reduced to avoid this, but it's also, I, I like also you to see how to do it and also to, to avoid your processing being too slow. Because I don't know, a different machine can run quicker or, or slower the process. So, Let's reduce it, let's make it smaller, so at least you don't spend too much time running this, and then you can increase the size as you, as you may wish. So um, what we do here is to find the area of interest, and we define the start range pixel, the end range pixel, start azimuth, and azimuth pixel inside the image. So you go inside here and you say, Remember, the, in this case, the azimuth is vertical, the range is horizontal because the, the flight is in this direction, north-south. 
So here I see 300, 800, send out this area here, 300 to 800, and azimut, so it's azimut, it's a range, 300, 800 is about from here to here. So it's a crop about this, this bit here. But you can choose other areas, you just go where you want. And once you have done that, you see that the uh, you can delete the full image, which is just occupying memory, but you don't really use it. So do this cleaning every time you can. <clears throat> Next bit is to um, filter the coherency matrix. I told you before that these RCM images were multi-look to one. Now, to one is way too little for working with polarimetry. You need to do some uh, average of these images. Um, if you have a distributed target, you need to filter it. You cannot read polarimetrically the single pixel, the SLC pixel, if you have a distributed target. This is okay for single target, for like artificial targets, you could say, but definitely is not good for distributed target. You need to average, it's super important. So uh, we do the averaging here. So in this uh, um, cell here, we first decide um, how big, how first things actually, we decide which filtering methodology we want to use. And here I'm using a boxcar filter. Now this is possibly the simplest filtering you could do, but it's, because it's simple and logical, it's good as a start point. And also sometimes you would just to use this because it's so simple that you can understand if you start doing comp complex things, you may not, you may start losing the understanding when you are developing new code. So it's better to start with simple and then go complex later. So boxcar is there is this little kernel that sweep over the image using a convolution. And first things we need to design how big is this kernel. And here I select seven by seven pixel for the window averaging window. Uh, you can choose, I suggest you to choose very different numbers. Go, for instance, with 3 by 3, or go, for instance, with 21 by 21, or whatever. But try different values and see what happened to your data after you filter with different um, window sizes. So we create a kernel. When you create a kernel, the important things is that you normalize it. So you divide by the number of elements this kernel contains. This is because you don't want the energy of your signal to change after you do convolution. So it has to be unitary uh, integral, this kernel. So you use the function once, which means all once, uh, for this size of, uh, uh, of array of, of matrix, if you want. Okay, the uh, function that you see here is called convolve to D, <clears throat> and you do the convolution for the three images pre average. And you get the image after average. Now, I leave it to you to, to have a look at what these parameters mean, because I don't have enough time for going uh, into that. But uh, be careful uh, that these things. Um, has to be there, otherwise you may have artifacts at the edge of the image, for instance. <clears throat> okay, so this one run. Now, uh, we can now uh, visualize these new um, filtered images. After we did the filter, we apply again the same methodology that we used before to produce this image. And the image that comes out is this one. You compare this one to how it looked before, and you can see that we are doing quite some goodness to the image to reduce the noise. Also, please have a look at different values of filtering. For instance, try 21 by 21. Uh, the results is, you see, different, it's more smoothed. And you will notice two things. On one side, it's more smooth, it's blurred. But on one side, if you look at the colors, the colors are possibly more vivid, more, uh, you can separate better things by color. And when you look at these RGB images, uh, really uh, color is polarimetry. 
you, you represent different polarization channels with different colors. So having different colors inside an image is a good sign, means that there is a lot of polarimetric information there. Okay, so this is done. One thing you could check is to, uh, to have a better look inside um, this data, the, the statistic, especially the statistical variation of this data. And you can do it by plotting an histogram. So what you want to do here is to select an area that you deem as quite homogeneous, uh, and then plot the histogram for that area inside the image. <clears throat> the area has to be homogeneous because otherwise what you get out as a distribution is a bit mixed between different targets that are inside, so it doesn't look like a canonical distribution. If you want to check the probability distribution function for, say, a field, then that field has to be homogeneous. So otherwise you start getting, a, at least it doesn't have to include boundaries. The field, the target itself can be heterogeneous and you will have texture distributions. But if you consider two fields or a forest and an agricultural field together, then you start getting things a little bit more uh, not nice to look at especially at this stage where you will really to see the histograms, the, the distribution functions. So um, we selected this area for the image before filtering and after filtering. And uh, uh, the way I do it is by creating a one dimensional array out of the image and then plotting the histogram with a certain number of bins. You can use different way for doing histograms. I found this the possibly the easiest for me. And I plot them inside the same uh, plot using the subplot function. I say two rows, one column. So you run this one, and then we get the, uh, the two distribution. You see, the distribution before filtering is much broader than after filtering. So filtering is reducing the statistical variation, which is good, is letting us uh, get more information out of the data. The next bit here is to uh, run the, um, the Clopotier decomposition, so which is possibly the core of this practical, so some really cool polarimetric analysis. And what we want to do here is to extract the parameter of the Clopotier. Now, if you remember the, the theory that you've seen before, uh, the Clopot here, what it does is to apply a diagonalization of the coherency matrix. So represent the covariance matrix in Pauli coordinate, you call it coherency matrix, and then you diagonalize it. All start from there. And because you, once you diagonalize these things, you also get the, the optimum values for uh, scattering mechanisms. So you get the, the scattering mechanism with the highest power, the one with the lowest power, and the middle one. Um, and then you can start working with these three scattering mechanisms as your components of your decomposition. <clears throat> so what you basically need to do here is to uh, do a diagonalization of a three by three matrix. But what you have is these huge images. So the matrix has been split in huge images. So how do you go back to the three by three matrix? And there are few ways, but by far the simplest to understand is by using a for loop. So a for loop is a function in programming languages, which allows you to repeat the same type of instructions just changing the value of the index here between a starting and an ending point here. So you have to do a for loop along all the azimuth value and along all the range value. And for each of them, which will be your MN coordinate inside image, for each of them, you put the big image inside the small matrix, three by three matrix, at the right place of this matrix, of course. So the T11 goes in position 0, 0, which represents 1, 1. You know, Python starts from 0. So the 0 for Python is actually 1. 
And so the T11 goes in the position uh, 0, 0 of the matrix in Python. Uh, the T12 goes in position 0, 1, and so on. Now, you may have noticed that we only have six images, but three multiplied times three is nine. So what happened to the other three elements of the matrix? Now, the, there is a very cool property of uh, covariance matrices is that they are Hermitian. So it means that the uh, upper triangular part of the matrix, so the, the cross, the off diagonal elements on top, are the same conjugate of the lower triangular part. So the lower and upper are the same, but this conjugation that you have to do. So we can fill in the matrix by conjugating the elements on the other side. It's a symmetric matrix, it's called the Hermitian symmetric. And these things give so many properties. Physically, it's a beautiful thing to work with, but we have no time to talk about the, the, the physics of the, the covariance matrix. But anyway, you fill in, you populate all the elements of this three by three matrix. When this is done, you ask Python to diagonalize this matrix, matrix using <coughs> sorry, metric, sorry, using the eigh function. Uh, this means eigenvalues Hermitian, because we know the, mat the, the matrix is Hermitian, and we can uh, um, use this this function, which is more efficient. This gives us as output the uh, d are the eigenvalues three elements, V are the eigenvectors, which are three vectors. So the eigenvalues are the power of the scattering mechanisms, or the optimum scattering mechanisms. The eigenvectors are the uh, uh, optimum scattering, um, <coughs> scattering mechanisms. <coughs> One thing that we want to do here is to order these uh, eigenvalues based on from bigger to smaller, so that we know that uh, lambda 1, the first second value, is the biggest. So since some time uh, uh, in some system this may not happen, it's better to just do it explicitly, but this at least is my take, so I do it explicitly so that I'm sure that the thing is working properly. So we are forcing uh, lambda 1 to be the biggest of, the, of these uh, eigenvalues. <coughs> Next step is to create the to uh, calculate the probabilities for each one of these eigenvalues. The way we do it is to divide the eigenvalue, which on pixel m n will be lambda one brackets m comma n, divide this by the values of the other of all the eigenvalues. Now. The sum of the three eigenvalues is equal to the sum of the diagonal of a scatter of a, a, a covariance matrix, because are the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix after diagonalization. And we know that this is equal to the span of the, um, the, the polarimetric acquisition. This is an invariant, is the total power that is being collected by the, uh, your, satel the, by your satellite. So this value here is an invariant, and this is the total power. And you divide the uh, different eigenvalue by this total power, and it tells you how strong is this eigenvalue, or if you want, the probability of that eigenvalue. You have seen that one of the most effective um, elements, um, outputs of the uh, Claude Potier decomposition is the entropy. So here we calculate the entropy. And this will be different pixel per pixel. So we have to assign it pixel per pixel. <clears throat> so how do we do that? So we have to start with a minus sign, because otherwise we get negative numbers, because these are smaller, dog is smaller than one. But besides the minus sign, what do we do? We multiply the probability of one eigenvalue by the logarithm base three of that probability. Now, Python does not have a logarithm base 3. So what you do to get the logarithm base 3 is to do logarithm base 10, or you can use the natural as well. So logarithm base 10 of the probability divided by the logarithm base 10 of 3. 
And there is a third theorem of logarithm the logarithms that tells you that this thing is true. So you don't have to believe me. You can check it on Google. So uh, basically, the probability multiplied logarithm base three of probability. If you are working with dual pole and you have only two uh, eigenvalues, this will be a log base two, not base three. So the num the base is depending on how many images you are putting there. So okay, this is the entropy, <clears throat> and uh, now looking at these things, you can sort of understand what happens, for instance, when you have a very dominant uh, eigenvalue. If you have a very dominant lambda, lambda one, very, very strong, the other two are very small, you'll have the P1 will be about one, P2, P3 will be about zero, because the others are very small. And when you put these numbers, so P1, one, P2, zero, P3, zero, you will see that your entropy is equal to zero. And so entropy equal to zero means one very strong scattering mechanism. If instead you have the these three are about the same, like you can have on random volume, then you have the this three probability will be one third, one third, one third. If you put one third here and you do the math, you see H, the entropy, is equal to one. So entropy equal to one means that you have a very confused scatter, a very confused uh, um, process, polarimetric partial target. <clears throat> um, so th there's a lot of depolarization if you want, if you move uh, pixel per pixel. So there is not much information in the polarimetric, uh, in, in the polarimetry, beside the fact that you know that it's a very confused process. But you don't have a, a dominant scattering mechanism there. Now, let's go next. Anisotropy is very important too. The anisotropy is to look to look at the n balance between the second and third eigenvalues. So you do second minus third divided second plus third. And this is a very cool thing too, and it's been shown in the literature that, for instance, this is related to soil moisture, which is also quite important for agricultural studies. Next bit, we start working with the, eigen, uh, the eigenvectors, so the dim one. <clears throat> and we want to extract the alpha value. Now, uh, if you consider the complot of the composition, you will see that the eigenvectors are represented using uh, polar coordinates. So uh, the vector goes uh, cosine of alpha, comma, uh, uh, sin of alpha, cosine of beta, ej mu, comma, uh, sin of alpha, sin of beta, ej uh, epsilon. <clears throat> so um, my suggestion is you, you go and have a look at that to, to make sure what is what, but then you will see that this code extracts the value of angle by getting the arcosine of the first element of this vector. And once you have that, uh, you can calculate also the average alpha using a Bernoulli process. So you average alpha weighted by their probability. So how strong that scattering mechanism is. So if you have a very strong <coughs> dominant scattering mechanism, you only have alpha one. If they are confused, so you have uh, an probability of one third, then what you get when you substitute the numbers here, is that, you have, uh, that the alpha angle is 60 degrees. It's a magic number, 60 degrees. <clears throat> uh, this is because alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three are forced to have, uh, are in a way, they're forced by the fact that the eigenvectors has to be or, have to be orthogonal to each other. So the three eigenvector must orthogonal so that is the, uh, the way it works and so alpha one alpha two alpha three alpha, alpha three are forced to have certain values if you have one third here you get alpha equal to um, so 60 degrees again you don't have to uh, trust me try these numbers you see it end up that way <clears throat> then we can also extract beta and i leave to you to find out why i use this equation here to get it so let's run uh, this, um, these lines of code. And you see there's a countdown here. 
I included the countdown with these lines of code here. Why? Because I'm quite impatient and I want to know if the thing is not stuck. Also, I want to know how long it takes to decide if I can go for a cup of tea while it's processing. So having a countdown, I always find it beneficial. There are more efficient or more efficient, more cool way of doing it. You can find your way. My way is this one with a countdown. And uh, when this is finished, so here we go. Ah, another thing you see here, there is some warnings here, this, this uh, runtime warnings. This is when uh, you have uh, something, some numerical error. It is not a big deal generally, because like a division by zero, these kind of things. If you have once on a while, it's not a big deal. If you have a lot of times, there is something wrong inside your code. You should check. <clears throat> but these are not really errors. Just say that in a pixel app and that you did uh, an operation which is not allowed, like dividing by zero. <clears throat> okay. Once we have uh, um, these things here, we can proceed running the rest. But before we proceed, I want to show you um, something to understand a little bit better about this bit of the code here. Like, let's have a look at the values of D and V inside the code. Uh, if you want to have a look at any variable inside the uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook, what you do is to click on the side here of the script, then you press B, which means open a cell below, you write down the name of the variable, whatever this is, it's D in my case, and you go control enter for running it. And then you see the numbers inside. And you see that the uh, it was not sorted. Yeah? The first element, the biggest element is the last, so that's why I did the sorting. But this one is bigger than this, and these they are all real numbers representing intensities. So what about the eigenvector? These are these are the eigenvalues. What about the eigenvectors? This is what you get, which is not very simple to see, but you see there are three elements each, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And uh, uh, this represents, the columns represents the uh, eigenvectors for our, um, inside a pixel, specific pixel we are analyzing. And this is a pix the last pixel, because it's the last D or D that we are looking at at this point. So let's delete this. To delete a cell, you click D twice. So D, D, and it goes away. Let's continue processing here. In this uh, um, cell here, I want to visualize different parts of this decomposition. And you see again, I use subplots, this time with two rows and two columns. You can play around with all these values and plot this in different ways. And uh, the output is here. So we can see the maximum again value is bigger than the second and the third. If you look at the Pauli one elements, you see it's not that dissimilar to the maximum again value. This Pauli one is surface scattering. This tells you that there is quite a lot of surface scattering going on inside this, uh, uh, this scene. Then we have a look at, because see, Pauli 1 overlap quite well with the, uh, the maximum again value, maximum scattering mechanism. Uh, having a look at the alpha angle, you see we have values close to zero. Zero is for surface, and uh, uh, the red bit here, uh, alpha I, is for uh, dihedral, and middle value is for, is for dipoles. Um, so we see it's quite a lot of surface scattering there going on, especially in the dominant. But because there is several scattering mechanisms going on, when you do the average, these things tends to get higher and tends to go closer to the magic number 60 degrees. So the entropy, again, confirms us that there is quite a mixture of scattering mechanism there, uh, mechanisms there. Although this look not quite stronger than this, but it's not dominant, there's still quite a lot here in the second eigenvalues and even the, uh, the third one. 
Um, so relatively higher entropy is due to many things, mainly due to the fact that there is some vegetation there, it's not just bare ground, uh, it may do to the interaction of the different parts of the plants with the ground, it may do to the fact that the, uh, the ground is very rough, uh, so the soil is very, a lot of roughness. So there are many things why your entropy can be high. And uh, this completes this part of the, um, uh, this part of the practical. Now, we are ready to go to the, the difficult bit, the time series. Also, you see there is uh, one with using SAOCOM data, which is also very cool. I don't go through that because it's basically the same. I, see, I split it into two files to make it as simple as possible for you, and also to give you a chance to do the exercise twice. <clears throat> but here I put these two satellites together so that you don't have to, you don't have to version for the time series. And maybe we take a little pause here before we start the last one. We get a little sip of water. <clears throat> I'm sorry I'm keeping you for longer than uh, expected, but yeah, hopefully we'll be finished and not in too much too long. So let's start this. Let's click on this script. Now, here uh, I want to, uh, to um, ramp up the complexity of what we have done so far. So the um, uh, first part is a bit more, say, educational for you to go step by step, trying to do things in an easy way. Here in this final folder, in final script, I try to put things together uh, so that it's closer to something that you can use as an automatic system. Um, uh, it's still not there. I still didn't go too complex that you could not, that you have difficulty in understanding what is going on. I still, went, it's a small step from the one before, but it's nevertheless a step in complexity. Um, also, my suggestion is that possibly you also try to run this using Spider, the other editor, which I find either when you want to do <coughs> more automatic um, processing stacks, where you, for instance, you have a scheduler that calls the Python function every 10 o'clock on Monday and run the code. If you want to do these kind of things, then uh, Spider is your friend. You want to use <laughs> that type of editor. So how do you convert this into a spider, spider uh, so into a script that you can open in Spider? You go to File, Download Ed, S, and then you go uh, Python.py. Once you download this as a, as a .py, then you just open it in Spider as a, as a normal file. So here we will be using Radasar Constellation Mission and Saucom, both uh, the things together. And uh, the first part is about the same. So you need again to uh, load your, uh, import your libraries. And then it starts, we start with defining our functions. Now, uh, the functions are all defined here inside this single script, Jupyter Notebook script. But the best way to work with this, as I was telling you before, is to create a library. So you create a .py file, so you export this, you download this as a .py, you just keep the functions, the functions, and then once you go inside your script, you import the library with, with the name that you assign. You have to make sure that uh, uh, Python knows where to look, <laughs> so he knows where your library is, <clears throat> but then you can import in that way. So you don't have to repeat all this function or these uh, routines, definitions, inside uh, your script when you're running it. This makes things uh, easier, your script gets smaller, and then once you modify your library, every time you call the library, you have the new files, the new scripts with you. You don't have to update every single script you have 
because all these things are inside your library. So that is my suggestion, do that. But for the moment, let's run this first on the Jupyter Notebook, which is simpler, and then you can try that later. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, the images are pre-processed using Snap. I love using Snap with that because it's very efficient and you can do a lot of things by uh, in a very quick way, a very automatic way as well. So I created this uh, graph and then I used the uh, GPT of Python to run it many times over all the stack of images and it's also simple and nice. So that's why I, I, um, I love to use uh, Snap. <clears throat> I think that uh, the images the file name convention of Snap um, doesn't work very well with what I want to do. So um, uh, I generally change the file names so that they look better, or at least I found them better to work with. You may prefer to work with different conventions, but this is the I show you the convention that I like to work with. So if you see the images uh, that you get after, it's just the name of the um, the image, the T11, and the date in this format, so that everything is in alphabetic order. And once you uh, run this with Snap, things don't come out in alphabetic order, and also they have the word master and slave inside the, the file path, which makes things quite, com for me, it's not the best to, to deal with, uh, with different images. So here there are some functions to uh, modify the file name convention and making a way that I, I like most. You may decide to use different uh, conventions, but my strong suggestion is that you don't try to do this manually, because if you try to change the file name of each of these functions manually, you get mental. Uh, uh, write a Python script to do this for you, it's so much better. <clears throat> so you take time to write the script, but then you, you save so much time after. Anyway, I'll leave it to you to have a look at these scripts. And also here we are using the um, one specific uh, um, library in Python called OS. OS. Uh, this is well known to, uh, to have different way of processing uh, things with different operative systems. So this has been tested with Mac, Linux, and Windows, but nevertheless, it may be that their output is different from my how my output look like. So uh, it may happen that you have to modify this a little bit in order to suit your, uh, your specific output when you use the OS library. Now this one converts the month convention, convention on snap into numbers. <clears throat> so because these are not uh, alphabetic order what these are, so that, that's why I do this. And this is a, a function to uh, read the file names inside uh, this folder, the folders like this one, and to extract the list of dates. So you see there are several dates here. So that function goes inside and extract just the dates and create a list with it. <clears throat> this function here is what we have seen uh, before is just opening one MV image. Next function, um, we basically encapsulated everything we used to read a covariance matrix inside this function here, so that you don't have to repeat this inside the script. And also it's written once for all. You always call the function, you make sure that you have no typos in your new script. This one needs as a input the path where the images are, but also the, the dates, what is the date, because you see in the file name, there is the date. Next things that I put inside a function is this, uh, uh, is the property of the composition. And why? Because this way, I'm sure that when I write new script, I don't have to plug this in, which takes a lot of line of code, and also I'm sure that I'm not making any typos there. And if this is written once for all inside a library, you know that library is working well, then I'm sure that it's working, you know. So it's a, it's a good way to, um, uh, to deal with these functions. 
The input of this one is our six images for the coherency matrix, and the output is the entropy, anisotropy, and alpha angle. Of course, you can modify this if you want also the beta coming out, you want alpha one to come out, you just add it here. Say you want to add beta here, you want to add alpha one, <coughs> whatever. You can add more things, you can save more stuff if you want. Okay, and these are all the functions that uh, I um, put inside here. We can run them all by run all above, and then we can start with the, the script. I said you, I told you before, um, we want to use the same script for running with different um, sensors, different folders, different values, especially if you cannot install uh, um, spectral and you need to code these values. So how do we deal with this? With this? <clears throat> Um, uh, the way I did here is by using if clauses. So it's if, if or else. And it's an, an easy way of doing it. Uh, it is also, when you're learning about it, it's also nice to, it allows me to teach you about the if clauses, which are very important. <clears throat> but it's possibly not the most um, efficient, or you can be more efficient than that, than doing all this hard coding. Um, possibly the most efficient way of doing dealing with this is by having a conf config file, configuration files. These are text files that you can read use the library config parser. And then you can basically put these things inside your text file. And if you format it properly, then config parser will be able to go inside there and read the values for you. As Spectral is able to go inside the header of a MV image and read the parameters for us. So I leave this to you to, to try to use config parser for bringing this to another level, to, 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 to the next level. <clears throat> so basically explain the if. So what does it go looking at this variable? If this is equal to this value, does these instructions. If this is equal to this value, does this. If it's not none of them, gives you a warning and say you, you, you are making a mistake there. Be careful. So to, sw so to switch from RCM to SAOCOM data, what you do is to uncomment one or another. So here we'll be running SAOCOM. Here we'll be running, with this we'll be running rather SAT. So it's done. Next thing is to start reading, getting the dates of our acquisition. If you're doing this from, uh, say, from scratch, so you did all the snap processing, and now you have to create your new uh, file name convention, then you need to uncomment this and run this code, <coughs> which uh, you may need to fix if you use a different operative system. Or, so if you use Windows and Linux, it should be fine. So anyway, you, um, you have to uncomment this thing. If you're just using the, uh, the files that I provided with this, uh, with this practical, then you run this bit here. Now, this cell here use the function get dates stuck. This use the library OS. And I've known of people having trouble with that. Um, apparently, everybody tested this code that was working. But if it is not working, if the OS library is not working for you, uh, then uh, it will crash, you won't be able to, to proceed. And you can also check uh, how it went by having a look at this list of dates. So if we here, we process, run all the cell above, and then we create a new cell here, and let's show this one. <clears throat> then here you see the five dates of the RCM dataset. 
If you don't get this data automatically with this function, it will crash. So what you have to do is to uncomment this bit. And so you basically hard code this vector and then it won't crash. Uh, this allows you to finish the practical, but you still have to go back to this get uh, date stack and try to understand why OS did not work for you, why you don't get these four um, values inside the list. But finger crossed, this was tested and will work. <clears throat> now, this bit is quite important. So what we do here is to create these uh, cubes where we contain, we, we, we put the, um, the multi-temporal information. We have several images here and each image has a certain size. So you can understand that you may start struggling with putting all these things inside your RAM memory. And because things can be easily very large, considering you're playing with some large uh, time series of say 20 images, you can understand this. things start getting very big and uh, you need to, to deal with it. We need to deal with it. So what do we do here is to create some cubes uh, where we have the first two dimension is the image of interest, and then the third dimension is time. And here I'm loose, using a quite loose uh, um, word saying cubes. Data cubes are more complex structure. Here I just say this three dimensional <coughs> uh, structure. But if you really want to use proper data cubes, then you can read more about that and use libraries like the uh, ZArray uh, is one of the. Um, a very good one. So anyway, we want to create these little cubes where we store all the parameters that we extract from the image for the block we are deciding to use to, to work with. And uh, um, what we do, how we do it is by selecting, first of all, the size of the block we are dealing with. Again, for Radarsat Constellation Mission, these are the areas of interest. So this is the area of interest. <clears throat> for SAUCOM, this is the area of interest. And then we create this three-dimensional uh, three cube where the third dimension is time. And this is given by the number of acquisitions, which in this case is five. So we create a cube for entropy, one for anisotropy, one for alpha, and then why not also the three element of the Pauli basis? Although we have the big image there, but maybe you don't want to work with big image. We prefer to just keep it small and then open and work just the, the small cube. Don't open all the time the big image, which makes things more efficient. So <clears throat> we run this one. And yeah, my suggestion is you also test different areas if you try to to explore the data more. Then we can start the processing here. So I'll start this, it will take some time, so I can talk over. <clears throat> so uh, what we do here is to first load one uh, date by using this function here. And uh, uh, we go on the list date for the index of interest. And uh, then what we do with this, we take a crop of the image. So we take the small area of interest and then we apply uh, um, some averaging, some boxcar filtering. And here is an exercise for you. I didn't do it because I like you to, to give it a go trying this thing. So these things can be easily slotted inside a function. So you don't need to have all these lines of code here. You could create a function like we did for the clock code here, where you input the pre-filtered images, and then you get as output the filtered images on the other side. So you don't have to repeat this all the times. Another thing that you have to input, don't forget, is the window size. If, otherwise, uh, the, the function, we don't know how big is your window size. But this is a nice exercise you can try to do. So take this and create a function on top of this script. <clears throat> but what it does, it does the, the filtering as before, then applies the clock here in a single line. 
And this is amazing. I think I, I love this kind of thing. So it's just a single, before you had only 100 lines, now it's a single line. Uh, so it applies the, the clopotier and then it slots the output of the clopotier inside the tubes that we have created previously. And does the same also for this um, T11, T22, T3, T3. <clears throat> so the processing is still going on. It takes some time. Every time you run this, he has to do the clopotier for all the block you, you selected. So this can take a little bit of time. And also you see it's still running by looking here. There's a nasty asterisk inside. It means I'm still doing it. Wait. So, okay, now I start in the, the final one. I can possibly continue telling the rest. And then we, by the time it should be finished. So what we want to do next is to do some uh, visualization of images. Um, a few things we want to visualize the Pauli RGB. I wrote the code in a way that it creates more and more figures, one after the other, for each one of the images. So you see it goes from all to all the images and it gets the values for the T11, T22, T3, stuck inside the container and then visualize. And also it's cool to put uh, uh, some text here that tells you which images, what images what. Let's see if this is finished. Not yet. So let's now visualize this RGB as finished. And you see the series of images is here. And we can also start to have a little bit of interpretation of these things. First of all, I would like to lead your attention on the fact that if you look at the different images in time, you see the color change. Seeing a color change is a good sign. It means that there is some polarimetric information that has been changed between the different dates. If the colors stay the same, then, well, you cannot tell much about the evolution of the plant. But if the color change, then you can relate this, say, change in color, to this change in polarimetric information into change of the phenology of the plant, even if it's just from a machine learning perspective. But looking at this change in colors is a good thing. So uh, let's now look, for instance, this field here, this circular field here, which is quite cool. So it's quite green in uh, end of July. Um, so this is Northern Hemisphere. This is when the plants are quite, in Canada, this is when the plants are quite uh, big. So it's most likely volume scattering. <clears throat> then uh, you see, a bit of the field seems to disappear, and also this one gets darker in middle August. And this can be either due to harvest, or it's possibly due to harvest, um, but it could also be senescence of plants, but most likely this, this looks like harvest. Uh, this in, this here may be more senescence, where the plants start getting drier, and you see them a little bit less, you see a little bit more of this case seems both surface scattering, so what is underneath? Then you look more, uh, the color changed again. Now it's a little bit more reddish. Maybe you start seeing more the stems at this point so with the double bounces because you go through the, the drier canopy. And then you see a bit of the field has disappeared. And this is on the 9th of September. And a bit more has disappeared on the uh, 17th of September. I think they are harvesting, they're taking longer to harvest. So probably either there is two species or the seeding time for these two algs was different. But they start in seeding this side, the left side first, and then when seeding the, um, the right side. So another thing that could uh, happen also at this point is that because the Radarsat constellation missions use different satellites inside the constellation, images could be acquired also at different time of the day, could happen this. And if this happened, then there would be some signature in that. So extra information, uh, because you, uh, you acquire 
you look at the same things at different times, but also you, you will see some differences in the polarimetric. You may see some differences in the polarimetric behavior. This is especially related to things like dew that you can see, you can have in the morning, but maybe not at other time of the day, and also other uh, things that are related with the, uh, the time of the day when the acquisition is done. But uh, in order to tell more about this, you need possibly to know the phenological stages or when these phenological stages were happening <laughs> inside uh, the data. And you can find a lot of very cool information regarding the, um, the type of uh, crops grown in the area uh, provided by the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, the government of Canada, following this link. So from there you can find, I leave this to you to look, it's a big data set, but you can find a lot of information, a wealth of information where you can start telling more about the specific crops that you see there. So now let's visualize the, Paul, the Claude Potier parameters. And uh, we see we start with relatively high entropy values. So uh, we have seen before the lambda one was quite surface scattering, but we had other mechanisms too, which create then, which say not bias, but bring the uh, average alpha to higher values toward the magic number, which is 60. <clears throat> so, but this surface is quite something in the fields. It's quite a, a bit of surface scattering. And again, you may want to look at the dominant alpha. In some cases, it's, uh, it's cool. As long as you use it together with the entropy, and not alone. Otherwise, you make mistakes. If you just use, use the dominant alpha without considering the entropy, then it's, uh, it's bad, it's not good. Then uh, the, there's a little bit more surface scattering, a little bit less entropy, a bit lower entropy here, telling us that possibly we see more the, the ground underneath. Here there is a bit, uh, an increase, a, a, strain, a change in trend here, uh, maybe due to some specific practice or, uh, other reason, but it's not very high. It's also linked mostly to the value of entropy that are higher. And at the end, we, not at the end, but toward the end, we get lower values of entropy. And uh, uh, this again gets toward more surface. And then uh, again, there is more confusion here. Maybe depends on the different practice that we're going on, but you see there's more entropy here than here. <clears throat> so that maybe, also the weather condition as well, the, the rain and these kind of things may also impact. So the wetness of the ground, these kind of things. So uh, um, this is the, another thing that I also want to say is that um, these are acquired by different uh, satellites inside the constellation. And if you acquire a different time of the day, you also may have a issue, no issue the things related to the amount of brine or water or um, uh, temperatures of that time of the day. So this is, can also be another thing that create a bit of fluctuation. Now, in this part of the code, um, what I, I try to do is to show these images with as trends. So selecting a specific field inside the image, and we can use the same that we were using before for the histograms, and then produce, doing averages inside and produce trends. Here you see a new image, new function I'm using is non-mean. So this is mean, again, like before, but excluding uh, not in numbers. In case that the Claude Potier do run, um, um, runtime warnings and produce not in numbers there, it will still work. So that's why I use this one. <clears throat> so we can finally visualize this as trends. And you can see that about what we saw before, but trends of the entropy, the uh, anisotropy, trend for the alpha, and these are also show the span 
which is related sometimes to the, the amount of vegetation that you can see. So uh, next bit here of the code is saving the cube. But before we uh, go with that, I would like also to show you the SAOCOM data, which are really cool. There is really cool stuff there. So we uncomment this bit here. And then, uh, so we select SAOCOM as the data we want to use. And then we can process everything above this cell here. So it's finally finished, and we can visualize our RGB images. <clears throat> and you will see we have two images taken uh, in one image March and uh, uh, so February and March. So the um, this is in um, in Argentina is the time when the plants are um, growing uh, because it's the southern hemisphere. And if we look at these two images taken in 2020, the images look quite green. There's a lot of green going on inside these images, showing that the plants are quite uh, strong, vigorous at this point. But if we look at the subsequent two, 2021, acquired in November and December, the images are blue. Uh, this is the time when they start seeding the fields. Uh, so it's mostly surface scattering of very small uh, plants, very small seedling. And um, uh, since we are using here L band, the small plants are not very visible. So what we see most is the ground component. We can clearly see all the ground here where the, the new plants are planted, while when we are later in the phenological stages, we can see the green of the plants. <clears throat> then let's uh, run the, the clotpotier parameters. And if we look at the um, an entropy, we can see that in February, March, this entropy is relatively high. There are plants that are quite big, and this they uh, mostly plant corn and soya beans. They are quite big, and so they, they produce some volume scattering. We go looking at alpha, and also this corroborate the fact that this is alpha is higher than surface scattering, except for few fields where there is some uh, uh, peculiar behavior. Um, so plants are there. We are looking at the plants. Uh, here, plants start getting more in the senescence, this is, so there's more surface that can be seen through the plants that are getting drier. If we look at November, <clears throat> the entropy is much lower because we have uh, the city that is mostly uh, bare ground, what L-band sees. Remember, L-band is bigger wavelength, 23 centimeters. So, you need quite some roughness to uh, to make it not look like a surface. Uh, so you see the surface pretty well. And the alpha angle is uh, very quite low. So we can clearly say we are looking at the ground. And then uh, maybe some, uh, uh, some plants are already growing, the entropy start getting a little bit higher, uh, but alpha is still quite pretty much surface scattering. We can run now these plots. And this is what we, uh, we observed before. Uh, the month where the plants are there have high entropy. The months where the, um, they are seeded, so it's mostly ground, are, have lower entropy. And in terms also of alpha, we see that the um, is low for one when the plants are not there, and this higher tends to be quite high when the plants start growing more. And last bit is here to save all these cubes um, in our folder. And the easiest way to save these images is by using NumPy. So save as NumPy files. 
Uh, but I leave it to you to try to use more complex ways. Like if you install Spectral, you can save them as MV files. Or you can, if you're using GDAL from the start, you can even uh, save them as geocoded images. So you can really choose the way you want. But here, as a, as a start, uh, we go with NumPy uh, images, and this will be saved inside your uh, um, your save folder. You can find them here. So this is the um, end of this uh, this practical, and I hope you have enjoyed. I hope this uh, was not too complicated. The second part, the one with time series can be a bit complicated. So I, I suggest you to start with the, the exercise, try to do yourself, and then uh, build up your confidence to move on this second bit here. And if you have any question um, about this, just please ask. We are here to, um, to try to answer your questions. So I hope you enjoyed. And uh, also would like to thank again the space agencies. Uh, the Canadian Space Agency and CONAI, the Argentine Space Agency, for providing this data, which are really cool. Really, we had, I have a lot of fun uh, processing this data, and I hope you will also have fun with them. And so I close it here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Armando, for the wonderful practical analyzing a time series of fully polarimetric RCM and CELCOM images using Python Jupyter Notebooks. As Armando already stated, the code, RCM, and CELCOM data used in today's practical can be accessed from the RSET training page. We encourage you to download the Jupyter Notebook and files and start working with the data on your own. Next week, we'll be joined by Pierre de Fourny from UC Levin to present on Send for Stat, a European space agency open source SAR and optical toolbox for operational crop type mapping and monitoring over very large areas. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box and we will get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website before the start of next week's training. Below is the contact information for Laura Dingle Robertson and Armando Marino, along with links to the training webpage and RSET's Twitter handle. Thank you, and we will now start with the question and answer session. Wonderful. We've been getting some really Terrific questions coming in, uh, so do please continue to submit them uh, in the chat box. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Question one, are single look complex SAR images useful in crop mapping or ground range detection? Hi, this is Laura Dingle Robertson. I'll, I'll answer that. Um, the simple answer is that both can be used for crop mapping. Typically, if you're only interested in using SAR intensity, you would only need to use the ground range detected data. However, if you require a richer data set um, to classify your crop types, you can use the SLC data and derive the polymetric parameters as we described here, both the fully polymetric and the dual polymetric parameters. Um, we found in our research that polymetric parameters add additional value in separating crop types in classifications. So the accuracies are higher and there's improvement in classification. Uh, the improvement in classification is crop type spe specific. So this improvement can be in explained by the fact that the difference in the SAR response from one crop to another is not only about the differences in the intensity magnitude of the SAR backscatter from crop to crop, how the wave scatters, how the energy is depolarized and the angle is scattering can be very informative. We've found, for example, that the Stokes parameters perform very well in crop classifications, as these four parameters specifically capture much about the characteristics of scattering than simply the intensity of backscatter. Wonderful, thank you, Laura. Uh, question number two, how can we geo-reference the output of Pulsar Pro? As SNAP provides, 
georeference output to any pre-processing? So I think this question was asked just before uh, we got to this part, but the Python script that was provided in the first part of the training that I provided um, uh, actually does the georeferencing to the output of the Pulsar Pro uh, data. So you can download that from the RSET website and use that to, uh, to georeference the Pulsar Pro output. Wonderful, thank you again, Laura. Question three, why wasn't SNAPT used for deriving polarimetric parameters, although the tool is available there? So uh, the polarimetric parameters that can be derived with this with SNAP um, require, currently require the fully polarimetric data. So that is similar to what Ar Armando was describing. So fully polarimetric or quad pole data. Um, and so this is why we used a combination of SNAP for uh, deriving uh, the C2 matrix and then Pulsar Pro to generate the polymetric parameters from the dual polymetric Sentinel-1 data. Terrific, thank you. Question number four. What is the difference between single look complex and ground range detection? I may so try I think, to... Yeah. Go ahead, Armando. <laughs> okay. I, may, I may try to answer this one. Um, SLC is a single look complex, while GRD stands for ground range detected. The SLC has the phase information. So the image in SLC is a complex image. So imagine real, uh, real and imaginary part. Are the images that we were importing in Python, which are composed by two numbers, not one. While the GRD is only the intensity of that. Also, the GRD has a, uh, have applied some multi-look to the pixel, a one-fold multi-look, <clears throat> to make it look a little bit more squared on the ground. So the, uh, from a practical point of view, uh, if you have an SLC, you have the phase information, and you can apply all the cool polarimetric SAR processing that use phase information, like Claude Potier is one, but there is many other things like the, the Stokes, like the, you know, the Yamaguchi decomposition, whatever you want to do. Um, if you just have the GRD, you won't be able to do that. So they, um, that's why we were using SLC, because we wanted to access this phase information. Great, uh, thank you, Armando. A question number five. Can we clip single look complex and ground range detected data to a particular area of interest and then do all the pre-processing? If so, how? So again, I think this uh, question came in just before we started to talk about it. Um, it's the step uh, in the order of operations, the S1 top split. So what that do, does is reduce the data to specific bursts within specific sw sub swaths. Um, interferometric wide swaths that the one data has uh, three sub swaths with multiple bursts in each. So what you just need to do is know which sub swath or sub swaths and which bursts cover your AOI and then you can follow that S1 top split to split your data down to just that specific area. Uh, terrific, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, question number six. When applying an orbit file, I face the node ID error and no orbit file is downloaded. And for some dates and scenes, it can't be downloaded manually from POD. Could you please help? Thanks. Okay, so this has been a problem on occasion for us, and we found there's different reasons why this happens. It can relate to a firewall issue within your organization. It can be related to the SNAP edition you are using, as there was a known issue, which has been corrected by the SNAP development team. Um, it could be related to actually whether or not the precise orbit file is available if you're using very current Sentinel-1 data. Um, there are threads on the ESA step forum that can provide suggestions on how to correct this issue, depending on what exactly it is for your particular scenario. And we put the link to the ESA forum there. Great, thanks, Laura. Question number seven. What is the difference between a speckle filter applied to ground range detected imagery and the polarimetric speckle filter applied to single look complex imagery? So polymetric speckle filters are designed to preserve phase. So you need to be careful 
to select a polymetric speckle filter for SLC data. I think in Armando's case, they were using boxcar filter as were we. So otherwise the phase statistics will be distorted and any polymetric parameters that you then derive from that SLC data will not be correct or accurate. Once you actually generate the polymetric parameters, um, such as the entropy, um, you can actually apply other radar adaptive filters um, to be applied onto those data layers. Thank you, Laura. Question number eight. During Stokes parameter generation, why do we why do we set five by five window size? What is the default for this operation? So this five by five window size, it's a sliding window size that takes an average of the matrix value. And what it's doing is further reducing noise. Um, when you're in Pulsar Pro, the default are question marks. And so there isn't actually a default uh, uh, number in those boxes. This can be set to what is appropriate for your area of interest. In our research, we found that a five by five window size is appropriate. It's based mostly on the size of our agriculture fields um, and what we're looking at. However, we often suggest that you test different window sizes for your area of interest to see how changing window size changes the output. So there's no typical one size fits everything. Wonderful, thank you. Question number nine, relating to entropy and alpha, uh, referring to slide 41, is there a list of entropy examples for PADI? So in our experience, entropy in particular has been very useful in mapping and monitoring crop growth and just not only crop type, but actually growth stage and crop condition. Um, we do not have an exhaustive list of papers to cite with respect to polymetric response and rice paddies, but um, in a literature research that will likely reveal research in the use of entropy alpha for rice paddies. So once you begin to work with fully or pol partially polarized SAR data from Sentinel-1 or RCM or SALCOM, you'll find that these polymetric parameters have strong correlation with crop development. We have one reference that uh, we, we've listed there that you can start with um, in particular for rice paddy, rice phenology mapping. Wonderful, question number 10. Is there a relationship between entropy and any other vegetation index? So absolutely. Um, our research has proven repeatedly that entropy, the degree of randomness, varies depending on crop type, but also crop condition and crop growth stage. The degree of randomness and scattering changes as crops develop, and that's due to an accumulation of biomass and leaf area index. So as you can imagine, even though the transmitted wave is fully polarized when it enters the canopy, as vegetation structure changes, as crops grow, the predictability of how the wave scatters, not only in terms of intensity, but of uh, scattering characteristics, decreases. So we found the entropy is correlated with LAI and also NDVI. Having said that, using multiple SAR polymetric parameters will improve the accuracy of tracking crop development. So think about exploiting not just only entropy, but also the other parameters that we listed there, as well as the other parameters that are available through Pulsar Pro. Wonderful, thank you. Question number 11. Last time the SAR NASA training was done with Google Earth Engine, is it not possible to do processing with Google Earth Engine? Maybe I can take this one. <clears throat> Google Earth Engine is a fantastic tool. We, I love it. When you want to test something in a place you don't have data there, you go there. It's, it's very easy and uh, quick to, to do analysis. But there is a um, problem, an issue with Google Earth Engine is that the data that are stored there, the satellite data like Sentinel-1, uh, are GRD. They don't store the SLC. So there is no face information there. And the main reason is because the SLC is so much bigger than the GRD. The GRD is much smaller than the multi-look. So they, um, at the moment, you cannot really do this cool pulsar process, processing by using Google Earth Engine. In the future, who knows? Maybe they will host the SLC and you will be able to do it, but not now. Also, there's a thing that uh, I'm not aware that in the Google Earth Engine, you can call snap functions. So you may need to develop them on your own on the, um, on the Google, Google platform. And, and snap is so useful. There is so cool methodology you could use there straight away. And instead of needing to develop them yourself. So quick answer is you cannot really do this because it's not, uh, um, there is no SLC there. Great, thank you, Armando. Question number 12, 
Can we also use Google Collaboratory as an alternative to Jupyter? Uh, yeah, this is another very cool answer, very cool question. Uh, and in this, you can use that. I, I, I'm aware of people that are doing that. So uh, Google Collaborator is, is super cool because it's very easy, it boosts collaboration. It's very easy to collaborate with other people. Then you can also store your data on the cloud so you don't have to download and store the data if they are available there, otherwise you have to put them on their cloud. And so it, it is a, a cool thing. Um, I, and I think you can use it if you want. Uh, on our side, we don't use it much because um, uh, it has some uh, disadvantages that we want to do operation on our server. We also want to maintain intermediate products on our server, our own, and we just share the final output. While if you are there, everything is, uh, is shared in collaboration, but it's uh, absolutely, you can use it if you want. I think it's, uh, you will be able to do it. Great, thank you, Armando. And looking at the time, we are at the uh, the end of today's training. Uh, so for all the people that did ask questions, we want you to know that we are answering all of them in this doc. And next week, uh, before next Tuesday, when we have our third part of our training, we will post that to the training page. So do, if your question was not answered, uh, we can get, we, we assure you that it will be, and it will be uh, posted to our webpage. But I do wanna thank everybody, all the participants for joining today. Uh, we had a wonderful turnout. We, we appreciate all the questions that people were submitting and also want to thank uh, Armando Marino as well as uh, uh, Laura Dingle Robertson and Heather McNairn uh, from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Armando Marino from University of Sterling. And before we close and wrap up, I did want to give uh, each of the guest presenters an opportunity to uh, any reflections on, on today's training. So Laura, maybe we can start with you. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everyone for attending and to just get out there and start using the Sentinel-1 uh, SLC doable metric data. As I said, there is a lot of data that's been collected very consistently around the world. So um, just get out there and start, start looking at it and looking at these polymetric parameters. And I'll just give a quick shout out if you're interested in finding a resource where uh, there's a community of people who gather and talk about SAR on Twitter. We have our at Sisters of SAR. Um, Twitter initiative, which uh, has uh, over 6,700 followers, and we talk about SAR every day, all day. So please feel free to follow at Sisters of SAR. Great, Laura, thank you so much. And Armando, if you had any uh, any last comments you wanted to share with the participants. Mm -hmm. no, just thanks everybody for being here. It's been a pleasure from my side to be able to teach you these things, and I hope you you will find it useful. Uh, if you have any question about these things, then don't hesitate also to ask later on. And please keep on using uh, polarimetric data. Let's keep the, the community going on. These are really very rich of information and we, we should all try to, to use them more in the future, considering in the future, there will be more and more quad polarimetric sensors as well. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Marino and Dr. Dingle Robertson, thank you both so much, as well as uh, Dr. McNairn uh, for contributing today's uh, training. And we look forward to seeing everybody next week. So on behalf of the entire RSA team, big thanks to you. And we, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.